Welcome back to uh, Math 221. Uh, today, in sort of the last uh, lecture before the exam next week, we're going to take a look at exponential uh, models. Okay. As I said um, sort of earlier in um, the week, exponentials um, give us very, very powerful tools um, for sort of modeling real world um, uh, scenarios, okay? And, and uh, the first sort of model um, that I, ta I actually talked to you about um, towards the uh, middle of last lecture, I believe, um, is the model of exponential growth, okay? And it looks a little something like this. So it's the, the, the structure looks like Q of T is Q naught e to the KT, right? Where Q naught um, and K are taken to be greater than zero. And there's a couple of things that I want to sort of note for you about this model. And, and the first one is um, uh, sort of what these constants uh, represent. Right. So obviously, because we're dealing with an exponential, um, once this thing starts growing, it's going to grow exceptionally quickly compared to something, you know, that's that's linear. Right. Where you, um, you know, take something and, and add it a certain number of times or something that's quadratic. Right. Where you're you're squaring the input here, you're doing, you know, two times two times two and so on. And, and this thing is just going to get astronomically large very, very quickly. Now, it's not the fastest growing function out there. There are faster growing functions. If you're curious about those, drop by office hours um, and, and, and we can chat about them. They're really interesting. But all that to say, this thing grows exceptionally quickly. I, I, I want to note for you, um, Q of zero, right, is, is going to be Q naught e to k times t, right? In this case, t is zero, so k is just going to drop away. And e to the zero is just one, right? So q of zero is q naught, which means, right, q naught gives our initial quantity. I can spell that right. Right, Q naught tells us like how much was there when this thing first started growing. And then for the second part, um, we actually did this derivation uh, earlier in the week, right? Um, and feel free to go through it again if you you know want want to practice. Um, but we know that Q prime of t. Is Q is is K Q of T, right? The rate at which it's changing is directly proportional to its initial value, or to, to to its value at that point rather, and that proportionality constant is K. Right, so we can put here. Okay, so that, that's sort of the, the function of these two um, uh, constants within this expression. And also note um, that, that, that sort of by construction, right, since Q um, naught and K are both positive, right, this thing is always positive and always increasing, right? If you were to sketch a graph, just to sort of see something um, rough. Generally, um, T is taken to be strictly positive, although it, I guess, technically doesn't have to be. Um, but this thing's gonna look something like this, right? Where this initial point here is at Q naught. And then if, if you were to extend past the domain, Right, this thing would continue down like this into a horizontal asymptote. So we can do an, an example with this. Okay. 
uh, let's say um, we're, we're in some sort of unconstrained in, in environment. We'll talk about con constrained environments a bit later, um, where this exponential growth equation totally applies, right? Um, and so let's suppose uh, we start with, say, I don't know, 10,000 bacteria cells um, in our culture. And then there are, say, 60,000 two hours later. Okay. So we're interested in finding um, a function. Uh, it, it, in order to deal with this situation, and then specifically to actually ask the question um, first, uh, how many bacteria at four hours? Okay, and if we go to our function, right, Q of T is Q naught e to the KT, we, we know Q naught, Right, so we can plug that in, but we we do need to find k. But notice we know at hour two there are sixty thousand. Okay, so we know that q of two is ten thousand uh, e to the k two, which equals sixty thousand. Okay, so this is going to tell us uh, that e to the 2k is 6, right, dividing through, we want to take the natural log of both sides. And so we're going to get that 2k is equal to the natural log of 6, or that k is 1 is one half times the natural log of 6. And, you know, you could absolutely... Um, if you wanted to convert this to, to, to a decimal, um, as I've said a number of times, it's almost always the case. Um, just leave it like this. Um, it's easier all around, um, easier to, to, to manipulate um, and easier to work with. Um, so now that we have a value of k, we can solve uh, for q of 4, right? Because we know q of 4 is going to be 10,000 e to the one half natural log of six, all of that times four. We do a little bit of simplification here. Uh, 10,000 e, I'm actually going to write this e to the natural log of six squared, right? Because notice e to the natural log of six is six. Right, so this is now 10,000, put that up the line, times 6 squared. But 6, six squared is 36, 10,000 times 36 is 360,000, okay? And notice that uh, making this manipulation here is, again, only possible because we left it as natural log of 6. Um, if you obviously, you know, were to put this into a calculator, uh, it would give you this, although you might have a little bit of a rounding error um, from the calculator itself. Um, then we can take a look at part B, right? and we'll ask, um, say, what's the growth rate? Right, and recall uh, that our, our growth rate of the population is just given by our derivative, and it's kq of t, right? So then q prime of 4 is 1 half the natural log of 6, which is our k, times q of t, which is 36,000. Sorry, 360,000. A little bit different numbers. And um, 
we can simplify this a little bit, right? We can divide this by 2, get 180,000 uh, times the natural log of 6. And then um, if you feed this into a calculator uh, to get a more exact one, well, we're going to get about 322,500. Okay. Um, on a quiz or an exam, I would prefer just leaving it as in, in, in an exact form like this. And sort of the next uh, wrinkle that that, that, this, that sort of comes to mind is, um, you know, we, we restricted K to be positive. And it, it makes sense to uh, uh, restrict Q not to be positive, right? Because we're talking about an, an initial quantity of something. Um, but what happens if we let K be negative, right? And, and what, what will actually be more helpful for us um, as we look at something called exponential decay, right? Um, another model is rather than um, saying, oh, make K negative in its value, let K still be a positive constant, but we write it's negative. Right, and then once again, this is still on this interval, right? T is um, positive or zero. And this shares a lot of the same um, qualities as our previous um, model, right? Observe that uh, Q of zero is once again equal to Q naught. Right, because this guy's going to become zero, and e to the zero is one. Okay, and then if we take the derivative, right? Notice we're going to get q naught. Uh, the derivative of the top is minus k times e to the minus kt. And if you move this guy to the front, and then note that this makes up q of t. This is minus k. Q of t. So as the name would suggest, right, ex exponential decay is distinct from exponential growth in that while exponential growth is positive, right, it's, it's increasing, it's growing, exponential decay is, well, it's just that, right, it's um, decaying, it's decreasing. If we were to graph it, right, we're going to get, so we want that there something like this. Although it shouldn't turn up there at the end. So something like that, right? Going down to an asymptote. And then once again, um, to sort of get the idea of, of where ex exponential comes from, if you were to look at the other side, Right, this is a graph of, of, of an exponential that's flipped this way, right? And that makes sense given that we have a negative right there, okay? We can do um, a couple of examples with this. And where this is most often used um, is studying the, the um, uh, decay of radioactive elements, right? So uh, there are these elements um, out there, you know, you have... Um, uh, radium, uranium, carbon-14, all of these guys. There's a plethora. Go and find your favorite chemist for more. Um, but they will randomly uh, decay and sort of uh, change a little bit of, of what they are, right? And this, this, this process of an, an individual atom uh, decaying is more or less random, okay? Um, it's, it's actually uh, one of the ways that... Uh, uh, computer scientists uh, will source randomness because um, it's hard to get a computer to be random. But if you're measuring the decay of these uh, 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 radioactive materials, you can get a decent source of uh, randomness. And while the uh, decay itself is, is, is random, um, the time that it takes, say, uh, half of the element to decay is pretty well known, right? It, it's called the half-life of the substance, 
right? After so many years, um, half of it will, 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 will have decayed, right? So for example, um, the half-life of radium is about 1600 years. And then, so suppose we start with, say, uh, 200 milligrams. Um, and so we want to find a, a, a generic model. And we also want to ask how many milligrams are left at 800 years. And so we, we want to use these um, pieces of, uh, of information to construct a radioactive decay e e equation and then use that to answer this question. Okay. So first noting, right, um, Q0 is going to be 200 milligrams, right, because that's, what, that's the amount we're starting with. Right? It, it's our initial quantity. Okay. And so that's going to tell us that uh, Q of t is 200 e to the minus kt. And the thing that we need to do is find k. But we have the half-life, right? which means if we start with 200 milligrams, after 1,600 years, we'll have 100 milligrams, right? Because half of it will de have, have decayed. So that means the Q of... 1600 equals 200 e to the minus k 1600 equals 100, which is then going to tell us that uh, e to the 1600 k equals a half, right? Taking uh, the log of both sides. So this should be uh, minus 1600k. Taking the log of both sides, we're going to see that minus 1600k is the natural log of one half, right? Or um, k is equal to minus one over 1600 times the natural log of one half. And you might initially um, you know, see some trouble here because K is supposed to be positive and we have a negative here. Um, this term is certainly going to be negative. Um, and the natural log of one half is going to be negative as well. Um, uh, I'll leave you to think through why on, on your own. I definitely and, and encourage you to sort of pause and uh, uh, ponder there um, for why the natural log of one half has to be negative. Um, but with this, right? we can write our equation. And I'm going to kind of squeeze it into the corner here. 200e, need a bit more room, e to the minus 1 over 1600, natural log of 1 half, t. Okay. And I'll put this in a box so it's separate. And then from here, we can read off that Q of uh, 800, right, which is what we're looking for, is 200 E to the notice this is going to be minus 1 half. I'm going to do that, that, that simplification now times the natural log of, uh, of 1 half, right? This T is um, 800, 800 over 1600 is, is 1 half. Um, again, on a quiz, or, or exam, this is what I prefer. This is the exact form. Um, we always want to be leaving things in the exact form because um, calculators will always introduce rounding errors for us. Um, but for those of you who are curious, this is about 141.42 milligrams. So notice, and, and this is actually really interesting, um, 
you you almost would expect that okay well if it uh takes a, a 1800 years to um lose a, a, a hundred milligrams then in 800 years you should lose 50 milligrams and you actually lose a little bit more than that you you, you actually lose almost 20 percent more than that which i think is um you know pretty interesting we'll do one more sort of like this um just sort of doing the 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 first part because I think you guys um, are are well equipped to to do the second. That's uh, taking a look the good old fashioned carbon fourteen, right? Um, so it has a half life. If I could spell that right. Of. 5,730 5, years, um, and we're curious, what is its decay constant? Right, so that, that decay constant is K. But it is worth noting that um, uh, uh, radioactive dating um, using, using carbon-14 is uh, a widely, widely used method um, throughout anthropological research um, to sort of look at the age of um, different animal and plant fossils. Taking a look at uh, you know, how much carbon-14 was in the atmosphere when this thing died uh, and how much carbon-14 is in it now, right? And, and based off of that ratio, we can solve these exponential equations for T, and, and that's going to tell us, you know, within an, an uncertainty interval, how old this thing is, which is pretty cool, right? Um, but in order to do that, we need the, the decay constant, and we have the half-life. What we can do, right, is, is, is take a look at, say, Q of 5730, right? That's going to be whatever my initial um, qu quantity is times e to the minus 5730k. But what does this equal? Well, 5730 years is our half-life. So whatever our initial quantity is, it must have halved in that time. And we can cancel these two. So then we're going to get e to the minus 5730k is one half, and then this follows exactly the same, right? We take the natural log of both sides, and then we divide by our um, half-life. So k is minus 5730, sorry, one over, I'll just rewrite that, minus one, over 5730 times the natural log of one half. Um, and for those of you who are calculator curious, we get 0 0.30s 1 to 1 or so. Okay, And this is the K that you would use um, if you were uh, looking to do radiocarbon dating like this. Our next model, um, they're called um, learning curves. And in, in my opinion, um, there have been better named curves um, with exponential growth and, and decay. I don't know, th those to me, they feel like uh, more, more visceral um, than, than a learning curve. Um, a, a learning curve, um, uh, they, they generally describe um, how people get better at a thing as they learn more about it, okay? And they, they generally look a little something like this. Q of T is C minus A e to the minus KT. And then with this function, we're going to note um, that C, A, and K are positive constants. And T 
is on the interval that we're used to, right? And what I want you to do while I sort of fix this um, is look at this function here with this information and uh, think about how this graph should look, right? What's, what's its general behavior going to be, okay? And I, I totally in, I encourage you to pause the lecture, um, think this through and sort of sketch it, you know, in, in the side of your notes. Do you think it's gonna do something like this? Do you think it's gonna do that? Do you think it's gonna do that? Do you think it's gonna do that? Um, so I'll, I'll give you a second, you know, to sort of pause, think about it, and then I'll, I'll talk through my process um, for what that thing should look like. So notice here this a to the minus kt, right? We have this guy, which is precisely what our exponential decay looked like, right? We have it called a instead of q naught, but it's still an, an exponential decay function, right? So this thing is going to look like this, right? It, it's going to decay to a horizontal asymptote. Because we're negating it, right, that, that's going to flip it vertically, right? So now our thing would look like this, right, where we, we only consider this part. But now we're adding C to it. And, and since we're adding C to it, it's going to shift our whole graph up, right? Because that, that's what happens when you add a constant. And so this thing is going to look like this. We're going to have a horizontal asymptote. And we're going to have a function that does that, OK? And let's sort of consider this for a second to see if there's anything that we can um, sort of figure out. Notice uh, q of 0, right? Once again, this becomes 0, so this becomes 1. So q of 0 is going to be c minus a. So we can label that point on our graph. Also, we can see that q prime of t Right, the derivative of, of, of this guy is going to go away because it's just a constant. And then the derivative of this guy um, is going to be a, a positive k now, e to the minus kt, right? And what I, I want you to notice about this is that this is always positive, right? This exponential is always positive. a is a positive constant, and k is a positive constant. So since this guy, is strictly greater than zero, we know we're always in increasing, which, you know, fits with the graph we just drew. We can also take a look um, at the um, uh, limits, right? So let, let's take a look at the limit as t goes to infinity, right? of c minus a e to the minus kt. I can break up my limits as t goes to infinity of c minus the limit as t goes to infinity of a e to the minus kt. Notice um, the limit as t goes to infinity of c, that's just a constant function, so we get c. And then what happens with this guy? Well, a e to the minus kt, that's one of my exponential decays. And remember that our, our exponential decay is approaching an asymptote. So this guy has limit of 0. So we're left with just c. So that means that, that, means that our horizontal asymptote is at y equals c. It's also worth noting, um, while we said here that the, the um, derivative is always in, in increasing because it, it's uh, uh, strictly greater than zero, which is true, um, if you look at this guy's um, limit at, at infinity, um, notice that it's approaching zero 
as well. And, and that sort of fits with like w w what we see, right? This is increasing, but this graph is always going to be concave down as it extends off to infinity, okay? And uh, the reason that um, th these are called um, um, learning curves um, is that sort of, uh, if, if you model, um, you know, the way that the average uh, uh, factory worker or, um, you know, stagehand or, or whatever um, improves at their job, assuming there's some sort of like, you know, hard data that you can um, look at that improvement through, it's generally go going to follow a, a curve like this, right? There's this um, initial knowledge, there's a, a, a boost right away in, in their understanding. And then things start to level off as they master the craft. But of course, this is a horizontal asymptote because, because mastery in its entirety is arguably impossible, right? There's always an improvement to be made. You know, say we have, you know, some, some, some company who's making cameras, right? And, uh, you know, through, through uh, training, all of these people, and they're able to um, can, can, conclude that after someone goes through their training, um, they're going to be able to assemble Q of T is 50 minus 30 e to the minus 0.5 T um, cameras, right, uh, T months after you start, right? And we can ask a series of questions about this. Right, uh, you know, we we can start with say how many cameras can this person assemble on the first day, right? And that's fairly simple, right? That's going to be Q of zero, right? Because zero months have passed. This is, again, assuming they've gone through some basic training. Um, it's going to be 50 minus, well, this is 0, so this is 1. So we're just left with 50 minus 30 is equal to 20. We can also ask, um, um, say how many, um, I don't know, let's say one month, two months, in six months, right? These can be found out fairly simply, simply from plugging it in to our equation, right? And uh, un uh, unfortunately, um, you do need a, a calculator to make these any simpler than this. Um, but also, as I've said, zero point five two. Um, but also, as I've said, you know, um, these exact forms are more than enough in any sort of quiz or or testing in, in environment. For for Q of two, we plug in two into our equation. And for Q of three, we plug that in, right? And there's there's some you know some simplification you could do here and here, not so much here, but you know you you could turn those into fractions. Um, but if you are a calculator curious because you want a more explicit answer, this is about thirty one point eight. This is about thirty eight point nine six. And this is about uh, 48.51, okay? Um, your book rounds all of these up um, because, you know, they're greater than five and, and you're following rounding rules. I would personally argue um, that they should be rounded down because how are you going to assemble 0.8 cameras? Um, but that's, you know, sort of a reason why it's easier just to stick with this because, you don't have to worry about making that, that decision. Um, 
And then um, part C is more of, of just a note, right? Uh, the limit of Q of T as T goes to infinity is 50, right? And so the average experienced employee uh, should make 50 cameras per day, right? Generally for these guys, um, you know, this, this curve, it looks like, well, you know, as, as you're learning, how many do you, or how, how much can you do depending on, on what the specific thing is, is modeling. And then once you're experienced, you know, you're close enough to that asymptote. One more model for you. Um, and then we'll be actually done with the chapter. Um, and they're called, um, logistic curves. Okay. And You know, you, you can make a similar argument uh, that these aren't named well either because it's not obvious what they mean. Um, to me, the, the reason that I pick on the name of, of learning curves is more because, like, it seems like you should know what that curve looks like and then you kind of got to think about it, right? With a logistic curve, from the name, it's not necessarily obvious what this thing should be modeling in the first place, okay? And... What a logistic curve does, um, sometimes you'll um, uh, see them called sigmoidal curves um, or S-shaped curves. That one's a little bit more rare. Um, they look like this. Um, okay. A lot more complicated. And we have A, B, and K are positive, um, and then, you know, T is strictly positive as well. I'm, I'm more just going to uh, show you what these guys look like, okay? And they're actually in, incredibly useful because they sort of combine uh, two of the models that we've looked at so far, right? Remember right at the beginning, I said uh, that we could assume that that, that example with, with the bacteria, right? It was an unconstrained in, in environment, meaning the bacteria could just keep growing and growing and growing and growing. Oftentimes what happens in the real world is your environment is not unconstrained, right? You may start in an unconstrained and and environment because the constraint is so much larger than than where you are that you're practically un, unconstrained right um you know imagine uh, a little kid in in disneyland right disneyland to them stretches literally forever right now as they get a little bit older they're you know able to see around a little bit more and all of a sudden some some constraints appear right um but functionally, the little kid had no boundaries, you know, as, as far as like from the environment. Disneyland was forever. There was nothing else. It was all Disney, right? And um, a, a logistic curve models sort of that process, right? Where something starts out nearly exponential, right? Something like this, growing very, very fast. And then all of a sudden the environment starts to, um, to, to constrain them. And sort of just as fast as we grew, we're gonna start to decay, right? Something like that, where we, where we run into a horizontal asymptote. Right, there's, there's, there's a sort of like um, uh, in, environmental saturation point happening here, right? Say, Say you have um, some population of rabbits and they're let loose on an island that's covered in veggies and no other predators, right? Right away, the population is going to explode 
And then all of a sudden, they're going to start, um, you know, competing with all of the other resources. And because of overcrowding, scarcity of the food, you know, other, all, all of these sort of, you know, um, uh, factors from the environment, everything's going to level off. And it's often going to le level off very, very quickly. And then, you know, sort of following the same um, uh, stuff that we looked at uh, in, in the last lecture, at uh, this point here, this is going to be A over 1 plus B. When you plug in 0, right, this is, becomes a 1, and you've got it. And then as you take this limit to infinity, this becomes 0, so this becomes 0, so you get A over 1. So that's a. Okay, this um, value of a, right? This is called the uh, carrying capacity, right? Uh, whether you're talking about um, a population uh, of, of rabbits or whatever, you know, this is sort of the um, in environmental maximum. Okay, you know, one of the places that, that you see this model the most, where it is arguably the most useful. Um, is actually the spread of diseases through a population, um, which is, you know, a bit unfortunate given, you know, the time and place we are in, in history. Um, but if, if, if you imagine for a second um, uh, some sort of harmless disease, right? Some, some sort of, you know, uh, say, say there's this, um, uh, bacteria that transmits from person to person, and it just like permanently dyes one of your fingernails blue, right? It's it's a trivial example, um, but it, it 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 passes from person to person, you know, through contact or whatever. And the world isn't particularly you know worried about this because it's proven to be harmless or whatever. Um, if 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 that was the case, sort of think about how this blue fingernail thing would spread through the population, right? Initially, it would be able to spread very, very quickly because there would be all of these people that don't have blue fingernails yet. And so it's going to be almost exponential, right? But then once it hits some critical mass of the population, um, it's going to start to, 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 to level off, not, not because it's any less transmissible, but because it's harder for it to transmit because there's not as many people without blue fingernails. And so things start to level off. And, and that's sort of why um, a, a bacteria or, or virus spreading through a um, um, population might follow a, a curve like this. And actually, um, if you uh, go online and, and, and sort of look at... Um, some of the graphs of uh, you know COVID cases, the total, uh, right? This is a map. This this would be the the the, the total number of cases um, uh, of you know COVID or other diseases as they sort of you know spread through these large populations. You'll often see situations that are modeled extremely well by these curves. Okay, and uh, so so let's take a look um, at a specific situation. Right, one of the places. Um, where uh, it's really easy to, to I, I, I guess, get these sorts of situations um, are places where there's a bunch of people living together and they don't interface much with the outside world, right? Um, places uh, like uh, 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 military bases. And, you know, say uh, there's one of these military bases um, and there's a flu out outbreak, right? And... Uh, they're able to approximate it uh, with this guy, 5,000 over 1 plus 12, 49, e to the minus kt, right? So we can say if 40 people... Uh, had the flu uh, by day seven, 
right? Where, you know, T is sort of the day since the outbreak. Uh, how many had it by day 15? And as with before, you know, the first thing that we want to do is attempt to solve for our um, proportionality constant, right? This K. And from this data given, right, we can see that Q of 7, which is 5,000 over 1 plus 12, 49, e to the minus 7k equals 40, right, and, and we can cross multiply here and get 40 times 1 plus 1249e to the minus 7k equals 5,000. If we divide by 40, we're going to get 1 plus 1249e to the minus 7k uh, is 125. Then, of course, we can subtract 1 and then divide by that coefficient and get e to the minus 7k is 124 over 1249. Taking natural logs and dividing, we're going to get uh, minus 1 over 7 times the natural log of 124 over 1249, okay, which is going to be approximately 0 0.33, okay. And since we have our k, we know what q of t is. And since we know what q of t is, we can find q of 15, right? q of 15 is 5,000 over 1 plus 1249 e to the uh, one, 1 over 7 natural log of 124 times 1240 over 1249 right that's our k now our our k ha had a negative sign here but there's a negative sign here so they cancel right and then we need to multiply that by our q which is 15, right? If you do some, some simplification with this natural log and this E, you can make it a bit simpler, um, but if you were to plug this into a calculator, you'd have that about 508 people um, have contracted the flu in this model by day 15, okay? So that's actually going to wrap it up um, for today uh, and for this entire chapter. Um, as you know, same, same with last time, there's not going to be a lecture on Tuesday, um, to give you a little bit, you know, extra time to study, um, stop by office hours on Monday. Um, if you have any, you know, further questions about the concepts or, or, or anything like that, um, shoot, shoot, shoot me an email. I'd be more than happy to help you out. I hope you all have a, a great weekend and I'll see you next Thursday.